I'm just going to uh, lead us. I'm just going to pray um, a prayer of, of repentance because in something like this, we need to make sure that all the doors are closed. You know, any ungodly portals, shut. And so last week we went through one kind of a prayer. This one we're going through a different one where we're actually repenting for anything we've done that's hurt other people, particularly the flock of God. You'll recognise the scriptures as I pray it. There's a lot out of Revelation. There's out of some out of Jeremiah. There's some out of John. But, um, you know, we're not exactly known for our love, the Christians at the moment. The world does not know us for our love, which is what the Father asked that they would know us for. And until we actually recognise the bankruptcy of the love yeah. and that we're not allowing the love, Father's love to flow through us and touch others, um, we're not going to really see heaven on earth like we desire because love is heaven. Love is the Father. And if, as we go through that book, um, The Ancient Blueprint for the Supernatural, you know, it talks about the, the Didache. Um, Didache 1.1 1, 1 is that there are only two ways, the way of life and the way of death, and there's a big difference between the two. Like, I mean, there's nothing else. But then it goes straight into, and you will love the God who created you. So the way of life is the way of love. And it's the Holy Spirit in Romans 5.5 5 that continually pours the love of the Father into our hearts. And that's what we've got to learn to be able to release to others. So this prayer is basically doing that and recognising that there can be spiritual elders that still influence our lives, things that have come down through the family tree, line, whatever, uh, or whatever. So but it's scriptural but we're just also repenting for any iniquities in the, in the generational line. So, um, as I said, it's, it's for not healing the sick, for not binding up the injured. It's caring more for ourselves than for the flock. Uh, it's running away from the call of God. It's if we bring disunity and disharmony. It's those kinds of things. So you're aware of where we're going. So Heavenly Father, in the name and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, we stand before the throne of God, the Godhead. And we desire to bring a repentance for ourselves and our family line. Because we want all iniquities <coughs> just gone. Jesus dealt with it at the cross, but we need it removed from the bloodline. So we repent for ourselves and for those in our family line who only took care of themselves and did not lovingly shepherd the flock of the Lord. We repent for those who ate well and clothed themselves well, but did not take care of the flock. Wow. Wow. We repent for those who did not strengthen the weak or heal the sick who did not bind up the injured, who did not bring back the strays or search for the lost and rule harshly and brutally. We repent for those who caused the sheep to be scattered over all the mountains and on every high hill and over the whole earth and made them vulnerable to wild animals because there was no shepherd or there was only a hireling. We will specifically repent for those who allowed wolves in sheep's clothing to enter and devour the flock. We repent for those who cared more for themselves rather than for the flock and enriched themselves at the expense of the flock. We repent for those who refused or laid down or fled from the call of God on their lives. We repent for those who bring disunity, disorder, disharmony and wounding to the flock. We repent for those who through evil practices polluted the flock. We repent for those who accepted or taught the doctrine of demons. Yes. We repent for those who taught from a spirit of error rather than a spirit of truth and love. 
We repent for those who agreed with unrighteous religious authorities. And Lord, we stand before you and we ask for your forgiveness for ourselves, for our family line. We ask forgiveness for the body of Christ, for ministries, Father, who have not ministered in your way, in your love, from your presence. Father, for ministries that have not represented you, but thought they did. God, we repent for every time that we have uh, misrepresented you, your throne room, your kingdom, or your government. So, Lord, we come before you and we ask you to heal us of any... Um, of any of those iniquities and transgressions in us or our bloodline, heal us, forgive us, and make us whole, that we might rightfully represent you. For Lord, we stand before you. Thank you. And we ask that we would be, we, that, and we declare that we choose to be leaders who are patient and kind. We choose not to be envious. We choose not to boast or to be proud. We choose not to be rude or self-seeking. We choose not to be easily angered or keep a record of wrongs. We choose not to delight in evil, but we choose to rejoice in truth. We pray, Father, that we would always protect Always trust, always hope, always love, and always persevere. So, Lord, we ask you, in the spiritual realm and in our ancestral bloodlines, if you would unseat any ungodly elders in Jesus' name. Unseat every ungodly elder, whether it's come down through a tribe, whether it's come down through a clan, whether it's family or, or, um, or cultural, any ungodly elders that are situated in our bloodline or around us in the spiritual realm, we ask you to unseat them now in Jesus' name. And Lord, we ask you now, please, invite and seat the righteous elders assigned to us and our affairs. Righteous elders. Righteous elders. Righteous elders. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father God, we just we just honor you. And we are aware of the elders situated around your throne. And Father, the only kind of influence we want in our lives is godly. Yes, Father. So please unseat every ungodly influence in our life. In the name of Jesus, destroy the altar. Dismantle that altar. Destroy the idol. Cut off whatever it is that feeds that idol yes, and establish righteousness and justice in that place. Yes. Righteous altar. Yes, Jesus, the only one adored. Yes, and the fresh breath of the Holy Spirit. Yes, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So if you're just aware of anything that you need to repent of personally before we enter into the counsel of the Lord and bring our complaints before him, I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would also remove all dominions, rulers and thrones that are aligned with those ungodly powers and just establish the Lordship of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Just to forgive us for our COVID cleaning. <laughs> it's part of the rules that we had to sign up for for being here. And so, okay. And just a quick little background just to rehash over last week before we go into the, the counsel of the Lord. The very first time it's mentioned in Genesis uh, 18 where the Lord came down and had a negotiation with Abram about Sodom and Gomorrah. And, uh, you know, he said, I've heard about the cries. I've heard the cries from Sodom and Gomorrah and I've come down to see if it's really as bad as I've heard that it is. Um, he's, because I tell you what, God is more vitally interested in the affairs of men than we understand. He really is. He's totally in love with people. He's totally in love with um, the world, uh, with the people. He just is in love and he wants heaven on earth. That was his mandate from the very beginning. Jesus going to the cross was not plan B. That was a plan of love right from the very beginning. And so... Um, Oh, it's going to be a weepy one. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. So uh, so he came down. And, and this is something I said last week, which we need to remember, that the cries of the righteous must be louder than the cries of the ungodly. When our, our cries of our prayers, our worship, our words of truth and love, the cries of the righteous must be louder than the cries of the ungodly upon the earth. Otherwise, you know, like it's an imbalance. It's an ungodly imbalance. And so he came down and negotiated with, uh, with Abram and Abraham said, well, what if there's 50? What if there's 40? What if there's 30? Down to 10. And, and all the way through Psalms, you can see David bringing his complaints to the Lord. And this is, uh, and, and God himself, he brings his complaints to us as well. Like it's, you know, covenant both ways. But we're talking about bringing our complaints to the Lord right now. And in Job chapter 10, Job pours out his heart and complains to God about everything that was going on. But we're going to start in Psalm 55. I'm, I talked on these um, last week, but we'll go over them again because I want you to see. So one of the... The things here that we need to remember is that the plan of God, the will of God, is Matthew 6.10. God's king kingdom has come. It's here now. Let God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our lives should reflect heaven on earth. If your life is not reflecting heaven on earth, then there is something there that needs to be kicked out of the way so heaven can completely consume every aspect of your life. We should be so different to the people of the world that they just want to come into the kingdom of God because of sheer jealousy. You know, like, and you look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 to 14, the blessing of the Lord was so powerful upon the people that the other people and the towns they went into were scared of them because the fear of God was on the people, but the people feared God. That was why it was there, right? So we've got to come back to fearing the Lord and walking in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So when you look at Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 to 14 and you see what a blessed life is and that's old covenant and we have a new covenant of much better promises and more sure guarantee and we're not living Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 to 14. We've really got to have a look at ourselves and say, God, something is drastically wrong with the way we've been taught yeah. or the way we understand your word because our life is to reflect heaven. So in heaven there is no sickness and disease. In heaven there is no pandemic. And we, we know about St. Francis, was it St. Saint, Saint Xavier, back in the 1500s when he stepped off a boat in, in Italy where a pandemic was raging, the plague was in that city. He was on his way to Japan on a missionary trip and in Japan he got thousands, tens of thousands saved and water baptised in like three months. Wow. And he stepped off the boat in Italy where the plague was and as this man of God put his foot off the boat onto the ground, the plague left the city. Come on. That's the power of God on one person. Right, so come on, we've got to lift our, our expectation and our eyes and our understanding of the power of God. 
And, uh, and so God wants heaven on earth. That means long life. It means divine health, divine solutions, divine wisdom. It means peace, joy, righteousness. It means the favour of God. It means that the world might be in darkness, but you have the light shining in your life and in your home, like in Goshen, where those people were set so far apart, you know, the, the last couple of plagues that went through Egypt and, and even the Israelites. But the last few plagues did not touch the Israelites because they were in Goshen. They were redeemed. They were separated, sanctified, set apart. And God is calling us to this kind of a lifestyle where we do live in divine health, where we do live in wisdom, where we do live in authority and power and dominion, where it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. We dictate because we've heard from the living God what he says. Remember the power of Elijah for three and a half years, it did not rain because of one man's prayers. And then it rained because of one man's prayers. The prayers of righteous people avail much. So there's so many righteous people praying about this pandemic, about government, nothing is changing. We have to ask ourselves, what are we, why are we not, why are our prayers not effective? Are we not praying in accordance with the will of God? Are we not stopping to hear what he has to say? Like, what's going on? I mean, honest questions. And God loves to give honest answers, which bring redemption. He brings redemption. So I want you to understand that in that covenant that you have with Almighty God, you live a life of heaven on earth. So sometimes we need a mind quake. Yeah. Not an earthquake, a mind quake. To just bring down the strongholds, the mindsets, the things that keep us imprisoned in a certain area where, you know, we believe the doctor's report more or the bank statement more than us more than the word of God, or we believe something else more than the word of God. God is God. And He's looking for a people who will live for Him. So in uh Psalms, Matthew 16, verses 16 to 18, Jesus said he'll build the ecclesia. He'll build his church, Matthew 16, 16 to 18. Well, this is a season of transition for his ecclesia because we are moving from the battleground to the governmental ground. We're moving from the sword to the scepter. And so that means a complete shift of the way we, we pray, the way we see the battlefield, of what the battlefield even looks like. It's a whole different thing. So it's we're in transition. And in Ephesians 2.6, it says that we are already seated with Christ in heavenly places. We are already there. Already there. So we have to learn to live from that place, from that perspective, from that realm of authority and power and dominion and look down upon the earth and say, well, that's got to change because that doesn't line up with the perspective of God. For those of you who've read um, Taking, oh, no, what is it? It's all rigged in my favour by Kevin Zadai. He said that the book that God wrote for you, the book of destiny that he wrote for you was written in heaven. So there is no sickness, no disease, no failure, no poverty, no lack. None of that is designated for you because it was written in heaven by a loving heavenly father. See, I know we live in a fallen world, but Jesus also lived in a fallen world. Yeah. He was not affected by any of these things, was he? Yeah. He walked in divine health. He walked in divine wisdom. He walked in divine peace. He had the answer to the religious Pharisees and scribes. He could read people's minds and hearts, not read their minds, sorry, read their hearts. <sighs> So we look at Jesus, who walked the earth as a man, under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, not as the Son of God, as the Son of Man. And so we have the same capacity That's right. to live as Jesus lived on the earth, under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Come on. We can walk in divine health. We can walk in divine... Um, wisdom, divine peace. We can walk and work and flow with the Holy Spirit as seamlessly as Jesus did yes. because the Holy Spirit was the, was the factor there. So we can walk with the Holy Spirit as closely and seamlessly as Jesus did when he walked the earth. The Holy Spirit will make us as dependent upon the Father as Jesus was when he walked the earth. We will be as alive as Jesus was when he walked the earth. Come on. This is who you are. This is your inheritance. This is what belongs to you. You are already heavenly citizens. 
The only reason you're in Australia is because God's got an assignment for you here. You are citizens of heaven with a visa to come to this nation, do what God's called you to do, and then you go home. At some stage, you are going to have to renounce your Australian citizenship yep. in the spirit realm. Hallelujah. Renounce your race yep. and say, no, you know what? I am now a kingdom citizen. I come from a royal line, yeah. a royal bloodline. Right. I am no longer an Aussie of Irish background. Come on. I am here because God sent me here on assignment, yes. but my home is heaven yeah. and my papers are heavenly. That's right. And so some things that we've really got to get in, in change. So in, in uh, oh my gosh, Lord. So, Father God, I ask right now, too, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you would deactivate ungodly discernments and gifts, yeah. things that we have relied upon in ministry, relied upon in life, relied upon because it was our gift, we thought we were good at it, but it comes from an ungodly influence, then right now, Lord, we ask you to deactivate, de-establish and dismantle ungodly gifts, callings and discernments in the name of Jesus, and we ask you, Lord, to re-establish us and reconnect us with God godly discernment, godly gifts and godly callings. Right now there would be a shift to move us into the place we need to be. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And it's because of Jesus Christ that we stand justified, vindicated, we stand redeemed, innocent in the grace of God because of Jesus, covered by the blood of the Lamb in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. <sighs> And one of the reasons that we are allowed to bring our complaints before the Lord, David did it anyway, so he's a man after God's own heart. But one of the other things is Colossians chapter 2. If you want to turn there for a sec and then we'll go to Psalm 55. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 13. And you who were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh... God brought to life together with Christ, having freely forgiven us all our transgressions, having cancelled, blotted out and wiped away the handwriting of the note with its legal decrees and demands, which was in force and stood against us, hostile to us. This note with its regulations, decrees and demands, God set aside and cleared completely out of the way by nailing it to the cross of Christ. God disarmed principalities and powers that were ranged against us and he made a bold display and a public example of them in triumphing over them in Christ and in the cross. Not only have we been forgiven, not only has the penalty for our sins been taken by Jesus, but also the consequences of our sins. That's right. Jesus took it all. So as you think about the complaints you're going to bring before the Lord, I want you to think about the spirit behind it. If you can nail the name of the spirit behind it, stay in the opposite spirit. Because once you agree with an ungodly spirit, you've come under its influence. So as you think about your complaint... Think of the uh, spirit that's coming against you. Not people. It can come through people, but we don't war with flesh and blood. It's principalities and powers. Make sure you stay in the opposite spirit. So uh, Psalm 55. It says, Listen to my prayer, God, and hide not yourself from my supplication. Attend to me. Answer me. I am restless and distraught in my complaint, and I must moan. This is the Amplified. I'm distracted at the noise of the enemy. Anybody here been distracted by the noise of the enemy? There's a complaint right there. Because of the oppression and the threats of the wicked, for they would cast trouble upon me and in wrath persecute me. My heart is grievously pained within me and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling have come upon me. Horror and fright have overwhelmed me. And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I'd fly away and I'd be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away. I'd lodge in the wilderness. I'd hasten to escape and to find a shelter from the stormy wind and the tempest. Destroy their schemes, Lord. Yes, Confuse Lord. their tongues. Yes, 
I've seen violence and strife in the city. And he goes on. So the first thing he says is, God, hear my prayer. Hear my prayer. He said, I'm restless. I'm moaning. I have complaints. There is a noise of the oppression, the noise of the, of the enemy. There's an oppression of the wicked. There's trouble, grudges. And, I, and he said, I am in anguish. I've got the terrors of death. I'm in fear, trembling. I, I, I'm horrified by everything that's going on. I want to fly away and escape. And the dove is a symbol of innocence. Yes. I'm innocent of all this. Yes. I've not brought this upon me as far as I know. I'm innocent. I need to fly away. I want to find refuge in the raging wind and the tempest. So there is a reason that you bring your complaints before the Lord. Because one, it disturbs your soul, robs you of peace, gives you anguish, you're distressed by what you hear and distressed by what you see. You can't find refuge. You just want to escape. And that's where, you know, um, we can escape into binge watching TV. We can escape into comfort eating. We can escape into whatever we escape into. I have never yet escaped into cleaning the house. That's probably something I have yet to experience. Some people, you know, when they're stressed out, they clean the house from top to bottom. I tend to bury myself in a book with a bag of potato chips. Um, but, you know, so but we recognise that sometimes we choose to fly away, but it's not into God. Mm because of the complaint that, that we want to lay against the enemy has forced us to deviate from godly behaviour. Yes. So we need to recognise that. Go to Psalm 64, verses 1 to 6. Hear my voice, God, in my complaint. Guard and preserve my life from the terror of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel and conspiracy of the ungodly from the scheming of evildoers who wet their tongues like a sword, who aim venomous words like arrows, who shoot from ambush at the blameless man. It sounds a lot like what's going on in our society with COVID and, um, and certain things happening there, doesn't it? Yeah. Even the bus business is being forced to close. Suddenly they shoot at him without self-reproach or fear. They encourage themselves in an evil purpose. They talk of laying snares secretly. They say, who can discover us? They think out acts of injustice and say, we've accomplished a well-devised thing. For the inward thought of each one is unsearchable and his heart is deep. Verse 7, but God. So in every complaint that you have to lay before the Lord, there is a but God. But God will step in. But God will intervene. But God will turn it around. But God. Yeah, but God. So he says, hide me from the wicked. But he says, God, hear me. Preserve me. Hide me. The enemy is wicked. They're full of evil purposes. They're full of injustices. They're coming against the faithful. Yeah. They're coming against the righteous. They're coming against those who are pure of heart. Um, and, but, and their strategies, Lord, they've got these bitter words which lay traps for us. We seem to be caught in words and mandates and but we're caught in all of these things we're caught in these things and there doesn't seem to be a way out and and anything that that um any, these kinds of words they sow discord they sow despair they bring slander they destroy reputations they bring division i mean our country is so divided so divided right now that is such an evil plan of the enemy he says but God will shoot arrows at them. At their own their own tongues will turn against them. They'll be brought to, to ruin and people will be astonished. Have a look in verses 9 and 10 of Psalm 64. It says, And all men will fear and be in awe, and they will declare the work of God, for they'll wisely consider and acknowledge that it's his doing. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and shall trust and take refuge in him and all the upright in heart shall glory and offer praise. So quite often sometimes in the midst of living through, um, you know, um, attacks from the enemy, the snares, the snares, the circumstances, all of the things that are happening in life, we forget that there is always a but God. And we can get so caught up in the complaint 
that we don't move into the redemption. We don't move into the restoration. Because Jesus came for the restoration of all things. That includes lives, systems, businesses, governments, everything. Jesus came for the restoration of all things. But we can get so caught up in what's happening in our complaint, we can be so caught up in that that we don't recognise the move of God, we don't recognise the presence of the Holy Spirit, we don't understand what's going on, and we stay caught up in it and don't give space for, for God to do a God intervention. Is this making sense? Yes. Psalm 142. Verses 1 to 4. I cry to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord do I make supplication. That means you've got to make it known. I pour out my complaint before him. Look, I said last week we've been taught in church. When you come to church and people say, how are you? You say, I'm blessed. Like life's wonderful. Like, you know, it's pretty good. And if you do have anything going on in your life, be very careful who you tell it to. And it's almost like they're sworn to secrecy because it can't get out that you've said anything negative. I understand life and death are in the power of the tongue, but if we do not speak out and say, I need prayer, I need help, this is going on in my life and I don't understand it. I need the body of Christ to come around me. If we don't do that, if we don't open ourselves up to the body of Christ, nothing will change because we are not individual cells. We are one body. We are one body. What affects one person affects the rest of the body of Christ. So I understand there might be people we don't feel comfortable with, but surely in the body you can go to people and say, you know what, help that's right. Help. I, I'm, 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 I'm dying here. I'm, I'm being swallowed up. I, I can't see my way out. Everything's so dark. I can't see the light. I know the promises of God. I know that God is good. But right now, I need you to pray for me. I need you to take communion with me. I need, I need something from somebody to help me get through this. But we have been taught to be hypocritical in church. Jesus came with grace and truth. Truth says this is the facts and grace says but this is the redemption. Let me redeem it. Let me restore it. So he says, deliver me, Lord. Where are we? I cry to the Lord with my voice and to the Lord I make supplication. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell before him my trouble. And when my spirit was overwhelmed and fainted upon me, you knew my path. In the way where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look on the right hand and see, for there is no one who knows me to appear for me. Refuge has failed me. I have no way to flee and no one cares for my life or my welfare. Whoever, who else has felt alone like that? Like there's just nobody around, it's just, just me and I'm not even sure I can find God. I know he said he'd never leave me nor forsake me but sometimes it's like, I know you're there. <laughs> I know you're there but I'd really love something tangible, you know. So this is what this guy is saying. My complaint is I feel so isolated, so alone. Nobody cares, nobody knows. I can't reach anybody and even if I could they don't understand. But you, God, yeah. but God. Yes. But God, you're my refuge. You are my portion here and now. God, pay attention. I've been brought down very low. That's in verse 6. I've been brought down so low, God. I'm no longer seated. I mean, spiritually I'm seated with you in heavenly places, but quite frankly I'm lower than a snake's belly. You know, like I can't get much lower in the natural. Deliver me. I, my persecutors have been too strong for me. Verse 6, deliver me from my persecutors. They are stronger than I am. Bring my spirit out of prison, my life out of prison, yeah. that I can confess and praise and give thanks to your name. And then the righteous will surround me, so no longer alone, no longer isolated, no longer there, no longer crushed to the ground, no longer sitting in darkness like the dead. Um, but, but God deals bountifully with me. What kind of prison are you in? Do you feel you're in a um, financial prison of debt? 
Do you feel like you're in a prison of loneliness? Do you feel like you're in a prison of like my family? <laughs> when will my family come together? When will it work? What's the prison that's got your mind held in that place, which is keeping your spirit there? Because your spirit can only move to where your mind is renewed. So what is your prison? What is your prison? It could be unresolved anger. Could be you're just so angry about stuff that you're not going to open your mouth because you feel if you open your mouth you're going to scream and you're never going to be able to stop. It could be that you're so sad you just want to cry but you feel if you're going to cry you're never going to stop. We all have these, these areas of our life that keep us imprisoned. It can be a point of trauma where trauma entered. It can be something that's happened. It can be, but whatever it is, we can feel imprisoned. And God is wanting to set us free. In Psalm 143, in verse 1 and 2, Hear my prayer, Lord. Give heed ear to my supplications in your faithfulness answer me and in your righteousness enter not into judgment with me God don't judge me give me mercy give me mercy don't judge me Lord I'm about as you know I've repented of everything I can think of I've fasted, I've prayed, I've, I've done everything I know to do, but still I'm in this attack. I've got this, this that just won't stop. God, is it your judgment? Don't judge me. It's not his judgment. You've been attacked by the enemy. And it's time to stand up and say enough's enough. Because you've got to get this righteous anger on the inside that says how dare the enemy attack one of God's covenant people. How dare he? he? He does not deserve any attention. He doesn't deserve the time of day. He's under your feet. He needs to stay there. But when he is, when we're caught up in a complaint, it's like all we can think about is the complaint. So our focus is on the enemy and what he's doing rather than on the goodness of God and the glory of the Lord and the power of Jesus and the wonderful presence of the Holy Spirit. It's like we can't even feel it. We can't get to it. We can't access it because we're so caught up with this complaint. So I've got to understand, you know, we've been taught just suck it up princess mm -hmm. haven't we yeah. you know just stand stand until we've been taught all of that kind of stuff but that's not about that it is about you know what god i have a complaint that's right and it's like you know in the natural if you've got people next door who party mm -hmm. and who continue to party loudly with the music that's boom 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 until two or three o'clock in the morning three or four nights a week, you have a right to go to the police station and lay a complaint. You have a right to complain if the building subbies start work before, what is it, seven o'clock or something in the morning. There are certain laws that give us protection and peace. So if we're allowed to complain in the natural, why have we stopped complaining, bringing a formal complaint to God in the natural, right. in spiritual? Oh, I should do it in tongues. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But we have not been released to do that. We ought to just keep speaking the word. Keep speaking the word. Stand on the word. Speak the word. Which is fine. We need to understand the word and to love the word. But the word is, a, is life. It's not a hammer except to the enemy. It's, it's life to us. It's, it, it flows with the Holy Spirit. It's just absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. Of course, it's Jesus, the living word of God. But you have the right to recognize when the enemy is coming against you and to say, hey, before this gets too far, I'm going to lodge a complaint. Here you go. Because I want it dealt with. Before it gets too far, I want it dealt with. That's right. And so this is understanding kingdom, understanding kingdom. There are kingdom laws, kingdom constitutions. Understand kingdom. You have a right to lodge a complaint. 
So you ready? Yes. Okay. So we stand in the grace of God and the mercy of God is all around us. Let me just say, if you want to learn how to lodge a complaint, Psalm 143. I love Psalm 143. It's perfect. So right now, Father, we're all at different places in our walk with you. We're all at different levels of understanding, different, different levels of revelation. But Father, I rely upon your love yes. to minister to each and every one of us in the way that is right for each and every one of us, individually and yet corporately. Yes. Jesus, we thank you for your grace. And Holy Spirit, you are the seal around this time. You are our protection. You are the presence of God in our midst. But we ask you to seal us off as we do this. And I call forth grace, more grace, manifold grace, and grace upon grace for all of us. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So just before we enter in, we're all one, okay? Lord, I ask that you would position us and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the sword of the Spirit, I ask you to sever off our lives every old mantle, old scroll, old weapon and old discovery that is not fit for the, for the present or the future. I'd ask you to sever everything that is not coming with us into the future. Cut it off. Even revelations that are no longer applicable, cut it off. We will not be hampered or hindered in our move forward in Jesus' name. And we ask as we position ourselves before the throne of grace, before God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, we ask that you would position us and place upon us new mantles, that you would release new scrolls to us, that you would give us new weapons and new discoveries and new revelations. We ask for the new. We will not be bound to the old. We sever the old and we step into the new now, the present future. We step into the present future. We will not be held in the present old, present past. We step into present future. So God, I ask even right now by the angelic presence that is here, that you would release scrolls, that you would release scrolls, scrolls, prophecies, scrolls, scrolls, scrolls to the people, that they would receive it, that they would hold it, that they would be able to read it, and they would just be able to, to tuck it away and say, yeah, that's, that's it. That's my mandate for now. That's what I've got. Let there be new mantles new assignments, new weapons, new discoveries, and new revelation. More, more, more. In the name of Jesus, I ask that every lie and every assumption that we have made from the do-it-yourself tree of the knowledge of good and evil, let it be destroyed now. In the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, bring a mind quake to each and every one of us. Bring a mind quake to us. Destroy the old, destroy the old, so we can renew our minds. Let only your truth and your revelation and your love remain. Reconnect us with Jesus, the tree of life, in those areas where we were being fed from the knowledge of, the, of good and evil from that tree. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Those mind quakes are going to continue for a little while for some of you. Thank you, Lord. So as we stand before the throne of grace, ready to move into the counsel of the Lord to be able to lay our complaints. We are all in Christ. We take our position. We ask for every spiritual being ordained by God 
angelic, cloud of witnesses, elders, whatever, any, any spiritual beings ordained by God to arrive and to be positioned as we take our rightful place, seated with Christ in heavenly places. I ask you now if you have a complaint against the enemy, have you thought it out? Is it written down? Are you ready to go? Because we're making a statement as we lay these complaints that enough is enough. So Lord, we ask you as King of Kings and as our judge that you would convene the council. 